over the Australian countryside, this is Shanghai Lil, making an excellent portrait of the famous Douglas Dakota. In 1988, Shanghai Lil was completely restored by its owner's Australian Airlines to the livery that the plane wore when it first flew for them in 1946. But she got the name Shanghai Lil in a different livery. Many post-war airlines around the world relied almost entirely on these planes, known as the DC-3, with the DC standing for Douglas Commercial. The majority, like Shanghai Lil, herself built in 1942, were actually civil converted, redecorated C-47s, a military aircraft, with the C standing for cargo. Nearly 11,000 of these excellent twin-engined planes were built, and most of the production line was committed to the military. For when they were built, America was at war. There are a few Dakotas that were built originally as commercial passenger planes, for that was what the plane was designed to be. But when the US entered the war, they were considered too valuable to the war effort to be left as airliners, and even these were requisitioned by the Army. The luxury armchairs and other fittings of the planes were removed and the airline's livery disappeared beneath coats of olive drab paint. 
The development of the plane started in 1932 when Transworld Airlines approached the Douglas Company with specifications for an airliner that would outperform the excellent Boeing passenger plane, the Model 247. TWA had wanted to buy the Boeing, but Boeing's production was committed to United Airlines, TWA's arch rival. United was part owned by Boeing. Douglas accepted the TWA challenge and a team set to work on the design. One of the first things they did was to study the 247 and identify the things they felt could be improved. They knew that both Pratt & Whitney and Wright Aeronautical were developing powerful new engines and, confident that one of these motors would be available, they settled on a twin-engine design, although TWA's order was for a tri-motor. Apart from the reliance on the new engines, they basically assembled the design from already developed ideas, like the Northrop aerofoil wing, retractable undercarriage and wing flaps to extend the surface of the wings at landing, and produced a plane, the DC-1, which is immediately recognisable as a Dakota. In doing so, they far exceeded the original specification to match the Boeing, good though the 247 was. Their plane was faster, quieter, more economical to operate, immensely strong and robust, and carried more passengers. Only one DC-1 was built, and that plane crashed. But a slightly longer plane, the DC-2, went into production, and as soon as the first of them took to the air for TWA, on May the 15th, 1934, inquiries and orders started to pour in from airlines in the US and Europe. The new plane revolutionised the sophistication and comfort of airline travel, even allowing for the introduction of the first in-flight movies. The US Army was quick to notice the Dakota and took delivery of its first example in 1935. Obviously impressed, they almost immediately ordered two more. All three, though ordered as prototypes for experimentation and testing, were soon turned over to service. Eighteen more, with the new specification of the large double cargo doors that distinguished the C-47, were soon on order, being used not only for transport, but as communications centres. Douglas also used the wing design and other common parts as a base to develop their B-18 bomber, to all intents a different plane, but sharing the economy and power of the DC designs. The B-18 saw limited service in World War II, primarily working as a coastal patrol aircraft. The commercial plane went from strength to strength, however, and soon development was underway on a new, further stretched, wider bodied variant with space for comfortable bunks for the passengers to be the Douglas sleeper transport, the DST. Pitted out as the airborne equivalent of a luxury liner, the DST took off for the first time on December the 17th, 1935. But the extra space of the new plane did not have to be devoted to bunks and sleeping compartments. It could be as easily configured without the extra windows for the upper bunks as a standard airliner. And in August 1936, the first of these planes was delivered to American Airlines, the first DC-3. With the war, production of the civilian planes stopped and the C-47's mass production commenced. These planes saw service in every theatre of the war, in all conditions and in many roles. Their use in New Guinea was typical of their importance. On the ground, the Allies and their Japanese opponents confronted an environment where everything moves slowly, trapped in the mud of the jungle. It was only in the air that the wretched conditions could be overcome, and the C-47, as the biscuit bomber, became a major advantage that the Allies held. <laughs> 
Allied troops could call on the Dakotas for airdrops. Airdrops backed by an efficient logistical train to meet demands for all the material needed in the front lines, from munitions to rations. The supplies were carefully packed to withstand being dropped from the air. The humble activity of packing became a life-saving skill. When orders were received, they would be hurriedly put together for transport to the waiting C-47s, while the pilots were carefully briefed to find the drop field, usually just a small clearing hacked in the jungle and marked with old parachutes from previous drops. By now, at the field, the C-47s were being hurriedly loaded. Then the biscuit bombers, escorted by fighters, would set off. 
I'm the guy in that P-38. I'm upstairs looking out for trouble. In those decisive months when the war in the Pacific finally turned against the Japanese, it was the C-47 and the parachute that combined to make the Allied victory in the jungles possible. Ground troops had other reasons to be thankful for the C-47's presence. For many a wounded soldier would come to owe his life to the robust Douglas airliner. Medivac units, using C-47s, evacuated wounded from combat zones to base hospitals, with nurses tending the injured in flight. The dedication, bravery and hard work of these young nurses should never be overlooked or forgotten. Just the knowledge that these air ambulances existed 
must have been a major boost for the fighting man's morale. Meanwhile, the Dakota was seeing service on both sides in the Pacific, as the Japanese had started building the airliner before the war and continued to build them with gun turrets as military aircraft throughout the conflict. Many more, probably over 2,000, were built in Russia and, together with a further 700 supplied under Lend-Lease, the Soviets used them extensively to move both cargo and troops. Here, carrying a Soviet parachute unit equipped for action in the winter snow, a Dakota goes into action. A far cry from the steamy jungles of the Pacific, but essentially doing the same job, helping to win the war. Germany's successful development of elite parachute troops, who had demonstrated their worth in the rout of the Allies on Crete, had prompted all the combatants to form such units. These men were hand-picked, specially armed and highly trained. At the core of their training was, of course, the matter of jumping out of aircraft. Easy to say, perhaps, but not so easy to face. To trust in your parachute and leap, encumbered by weapons, into the air over enemy-held ground. The training on how to jump, and as importantly, how to land, was extended and thorough. The plane they jumped from was, in the main, the C-47, once again filling a need and doing so superbly. Another means of getting men to war was the glider, and in World War II, most of the Allies' glider towing was done by C-47s. The gliders were frail craft, and in actual combat they proved to be a haphazard and very risky proposition. <laughs> 
The sturdy fuselage of the C-47 was speculatively studied and consideration was actually given to using them as gliders. But common sense prevailed. The Dakota was far too valuable to be regarded as a disposable item and the idea was dropped abruptly. Tactical air transport required moving not only men but machines. The C-47 could carry howitzers and many forms of armour. It could also carry the ubiquitous Willys Jeep and throughout the war huge quantities of machinery were ferried in its capacious fuselage. On thousands of occasions, the Dakota proved its worth in many roles as a prime factor in the Allies' ability to wage war. But one task could be said to have been both its most important test and its greatest success, its role in Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings at Normandy. The invasion of German-occupied Europe was the biggest movement of men and equipment over water ever undertaken. In the part of that movement that used air transport, it was the C-47, predictably efficient, that played the crucial role. With white invasion stripes specially painted on the planes to protect them from being fired at in mistake by Allied anti-aircraft batteries, they set about their three tasks. Towing gliders, dropping parachutists and ferrying supplies to the invasion forces. Over 1,000 C-47s were in action on D-Day and in the tense weeks that followed. After D-Day, the cost of the use of gliders could be assessed and it proved much higher than had been anticipated. It had been envisaged that there would be losses of gliders and their cargoes of troops and equipment, but the scale of the losses was staggering. Theoretically, even the gliders themselves were reusable. They were to be collected and recycled for repeated use. <laughs> 
Instead, they were more a disposable item, as many of them were well beyond salvaging. More critical was the losses among the pilots, who, sitting at the front of the gliders, suffered disproportionately high casualties. These pilots were trained to almost the same level as their powered aircraft counterparts, and in addition, they had to be capable of operating, after landing, as fighting soldiers. They were an expensive investment and hard to replace. The third charter of costs was in the glider's inability to deliver an effective fighting force to the ground, ready for immediate battle. Instead, there were unacceptably high casualties, and a large proportion of those soldiers who did arrive intact were dazed and confused, shocked by the violence of their crash landings. In addition, they were confronted by lack of equipment, lost with gliders that had crashed or landed elsewhere. Had the Germans been on hand in force as the gliders landed, the results may have been catastrophic. The gliders were used because they were available and because the reality of their failings was not foreseen. The courage and training of the troops they carried did bring limited success to their operations, but after a similar experience with use of gliders at Arnhem, they were abandoned and in future other, more reliable means would be devised. Like the DC-3, the DC-4 continued in service for many years. Often overlooked, dwarfed by the reputation of its smaller cousin, the Skymaster, with its larger size and four engines, could fly across the Atlantic and had a very successful career. After World War II, the Dakotas could have expected a quieter life. But within a few years, they moved on to another conflict, Korea. For a while in Korea, the Dakotas provided the same variety of services that they had during the World War, but other models were coming that divided the many roles of the C-47 into specialist areas. Here, Douglas's massive Globemaster is seen catering for armour carrying that its smaller brother could never have attempted. The role of parachute carrier was catered for by new, specially designed and equipped planes, like this Fairchild packet. Its twin boom tail permitted a rear exit, purpose designed for dropping parachutes, whether they supported supplies or troops. specialist planes continued and the need for tactical air transport was never higher than during the war in Vietnam. But despite its age and theoretical redundancy, even in Vietnam it was possibly only the C-130 Hercules that filled as many roles as the C-47. The Hercules was of course a completely different generation of aircraft, with jet engines powering its propellers. But its virtues of versatility and hardiness were those that had made the Dakota legendary.
specialist developments was the Fairchild Provider, a clever design for the role of assault transport. The plane was, in some ways, designed as a powered glider. If necessary, it could be considered a disposable item. Its wings were designed to shear off if they hit something, rather than slew the plane round as the older gliders had done so disastrously at Normandy. Fortunately, the providers rarely had to resort to making tactical crash landings. As this procession of specialist aircraft developed, it could be seen that by Vietnam, time may have run out for the C-47. Eventually, ironically, its prime advantage was to be its versatility. It seemed that there would always be work for them as long as they could fly. In Indochina, one of the uses of the Dakotas was in electronic warfare. Here, highly trained technicians board a specially equipped C-47, which is probably older than any of them. The purpose of these special missions was to establish the coordinates of enemy radio from several different positions, 
Flying low and slow, the C-47 was an excellent platform to pinpoint exactly where enemy targets were. The information would then be transmitted to American bombers so that the steamy jungle of Southeast Asia was no longer able to provide an impenetrable cover for enemy troop movement. This type of operation was generally considered to be quite successful. Another application for the venerable C-47 in Vietnam was its use in psychological warfare. Trying to win the hearts and minds of Vietnamese villagers who were also constantly under pressure from the Viet Cong was a battle in its own right. Efforts to convince members of the Viet Cong itself to defect were considered a priority. Working on the premise that in some cases the pen could be mightier than the sword, literally millions of pamphlets were printed to be scattered over the jungle. For this type of work, the Durable 47 was probably more suitable than anything in the modern inventory. Judging the effects of psychological warfare is difficult, but certainly the practice was considered worth continuing for several years. Keeping the 47s airworthy was fundamental because a crash or even a forced landing in hostile areas of Vietnam would have dire ramifications. Here, high-speed Gatling guns with phenomenal firepower have been mounted in the aircraft as possibly the most warlike manifestation of the sturdy Dakotas as a gun platform. Missions would be meticulously planned so that the crew involved knew exactly what areas were to be saturated with gunfire. The men took enormous risks, flying at very low levels, often in the dark of night, 
to utilize what was one of the most novel and effective forms of combating concentrations of enemy troops. In this way, many Vietnamese villages and US garrisons were defended. Here, flares are being loaded on board, past the ugly snout of one of the Gatling guns. Before every strike, senior American officers would liaise with South Vietnamese officials to advise them of the intention of the mission and to compare the latest intelligence. Flying into the night, the Dakota's crew would be advised of the final go-ahead as they navigated towards the target zone. The difficulties these men encountered and the risks they took were considered to be worthwhile. The Gatling gun Dakota was one of the few ways that such intense firepower could be moved into an area that may have erupted as a trouble spot over a matter of a few hours. a century after its first flight, the Douglas Commercial Model No. 3, conceived for no other reason than to provide TWA a counter to the Boeing aircraft that United flew so many years ago, is still finding useful roles in both civil and military use. And it poses the question, does a really good design ever become obsolete? Those who served and flew on the legendary Dakota would surely know the answer. Back in 1953, the United States Air Force awarded its highest non-combatant civilian decoration, the Exceptional Service Award, to Donald W. Douglas. The citation reads, Donald Wills Douglas distinguished himself by rendering exceptional service to the United States Air Force and his country through his contribution to the development of military and civilian aviation over the past 40 years.
The soundness of his technical skill is best illustrated by the DC-3, which unquestionably ranks as the best single airplane ever built. That unqualified assessment of the plane is still one that very many people around the world would wholeheartedly endorse. <laughs>